Uju, Wago Shindigu, Migizi and Odin, Gazagasquaji Mekag, Hindu and Jiba. Today I'd like to share a little bit about Ojibwe naming ceremonies. This is an ancient custom, and there's quite a bit of variation across Ojibwe country around it. So I'll share just a little bit about what we do in my family. First of all, names, and sometimes we call naming ceremonies namesake ceremonies because it establishes an important relationship between the person receiving a name and the person who is giving the name. It functions somewhat like a godparent relationship in other cultures. And in Ojibwe, there's a lot built in even to the meaning of the namesake relationship. In Ojibwe, our word for my body is ni yao. Ni yao is my body. And the word for my namesake is niyawe'e, niyawe'e. And you'll notice the same root, niyo and niyawe'e. And the reason is, in Ojibwe culture, we believe that it's not so much the case that we have souls, it's more like we are souls and we have bodies for a little while. The body is viewed like a cup. It's temporary housing for our soul. And as a result, um, when we think about the naming ceremony itself, we're not human beings looking for a spiritual experience. We're spirits having a temporary human experience. And the body as a housing for the soul, like when a baby is born, the spirit for that child is hovering around the mother uh, while the baby's in utero. When the baby's born and takes his or her first breath, the spirit enters the body and stays there as long as we live. In addition to the soul inhabiting the body, we also believe that other things can be poured in. So the body's like a cup. Every time you receive a legend, a teaching, ceremony songs, um, things like that, it's filling your cup with good things that pushes the bad things out, which is one of the reasons why it's really healthy and healing to go to ceremonies because we're absorbing that positive energy and it's pushing out the dark energy from our uh, negative experiences, you know, earlier in the day um, and things like that. So when somebody gets a name, the word niya is used both ways. So like if I gave a name to a child, I would call that child niya and the child would also call me niya Sometimes we use short forms too, you know, niya wet. Uh, just as cute forms between namesakes as well. And so there's a lot built in in that understanding of what a namesake is and how a namesake should function for somebody who's to receive a name. Also, something else that's kind of different about the Ojibwe culture is that the parents uh, almost never function as namesakes for their own children. Uh, and in my family, what we do is that the parents <clears throat> both work together to pick namesakes. And for all of my children, I actually have nine children. There are five boys and four girls, and they all have multiple namesakes and namesakes that are both men and women. Because we believe that it's important to have people in positions of authority in their lives who are male and female. And we believe there are special teachings and perspectives and intuitions uh, that are inherent to, to each. So uh, that establishes kind of a favorite auntie, uncle, grandparent type relationship with their namesakes. And then sometimes the parents may have different ideas about who should be a namesake and that's fine. Both should be empowered to pick different ones. In my family, we have been taught that a person can have up to seven different namesakes. And sometimes a person might throughout their life um, even add more names to what they were given. Like when I was a little baby, I was actually given one name. And as I got older uh, and was having a hard time, I reached out, my namesake had died when I was very young uh, and reached out and asked for another one. And so that doesn't diminish or take away my first name, it just adds to it. And sometimes when people get sick or they reach a new phase in their li life, they may actually wanna reach out and, and get more namesakes um, as a means of getting more help or more mentors in their life. So for me, uh, I ended up having 
a couple of important namesakes that were really important spiritual guides and mentors. As my children came into the world, we actually lined up several namesakes for each child. Uh, and they've been some of the greatest teachers and supports for them at all phases of their lives. In Ojibwe, we also believe that when a little bitty baby is crying, they have a distinct cry. And it kind of sounds like, ah, 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 ah. and we believe that little babies are actually crying for namesakes. Uh, and the, ch the cries of children change as they age. They have many different kinds of cries. Their personalities are reflected in them and things like that. But uh, that initial cry, there's a lot of similarity um, between the cries of all babies. So for us, what we do is we will go around passing tobacco to namesakes and different people are gifted with their gift to give names in different ways. For example, uh, Leonard Moose, who is an important namesake for some of my children, for him, we would pass tobacco and he would wait until he had a dream about the child. And then he would give us a phone call and say, I had the dream, I'm ready to do the naming ceremony. Other people like Tom Stilday was an important namesake for some of our children too. And as soon as you gave him tobacco, he would say, well, I was fasting as a young man and I acquired the right to give names when I was fasting. So I can perform your child's naming ceremony anytime. Uh, and the same was the case with Archie Mose, who was a namesake for uh, my firstborn child uh, and a number of other people as well. So we just work with the gifts of whoever's going to be a, a name giver or a namesake. And when they're ready, we would set up the naming ceremony. For some of our kids, it happened very early, soon after they were born. And others, it took some months to, uh, to put it together or what, before everybody was really ready for the naming ceremony itself. And at the naming ceremony, we prepare food. Uh, so usually put on a traditional native feast. So for us, that would mean, you know, wild rice, we'd have wild game, fish, um, different kinds of vegetables, um, and so forth. And then at the start of the ceremony, we would pass tobacco again to namesakes. Um, they'd load their pipes and they would, um, we would also prepare a dish of food for each of our, each of the namesakes. And those would be placed in front of them. And then whoever is officiating at the, the naming ceremony would begin to talk. And actually the first thing that people usually talk about is the acceptance of the tobacco, which is spiritual payment. Uh, and so they're saying, I'm gonna make a promise to this child and I'm gonna be there for this child as long as I'm alive. Uh, this baby can call on me anytime. Normally we'd have to give tobacco each time we ask something, but because I'm taking this tobacco as a namesake today, I will always be there for the spiritual guidance and support of this child, call upon me. The other thing that we constantly do uh, at our naming ceremonies is that the name givers end up also instilling teachings. So they take the baby and into the baby's cup begin to go teachings like respect all things, respect all beings, all the animals, birds, fish, and your fellow humans. Um, we were given a tool, the first plant tobacco to use as a way to show respect. Make sure that you make your tobacco offerings in the water when you come to a new body of water. Make sure that you, you know, use tobacco if you harvest a plant, an animal, a bird, or a fish for food uh, and so forth. And so they'll instill teachings We'll talk about there's a, there are four seasons in uh, each year, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And there are four seasons in a person's life, babies, young people, adults, elders. And they'll pray that this baby gets to see all of his or her seasons. In addition to that, they'll provide teaching specific to the child's um, gender. Uh, and we'll talk about the importance of having a good work ethic and taking care of other people, being responsible to others. And so all of these teachings are kind of added to the child's cup. And then one at a time, the namesakes will also talk about the names that they want to give. So they will share a dream that they had or a vision that they had when they were fasting. In our way, it's not so much that the names come from the namesakes, the names come 
from the money dug from the spirits to the namesake to then give to the uh, person who is being named. And so in many ways, the namesakes are seen as translators for uh, this spiritual process. The only spiritual requirement in my, in my family for somebody to be a namesake, to be a name giver, is that they themselves have been through the ceremony and have their native name. So it's kind of like, if you didn't do that, it'd be like somebody teaching someone how to drive who's never been behind the wheel of a car. Uh, so you kind of need that spiritual empowerment and have had that experience yourself. So some of our namesakes, we usually, you know, rely upon uh, people who are older and well-respected, but we also have been intentional about picking some younger namesakes. Someone who's, uh, you know, if we have a, a male child, we would pick somebody who is able to, you know, be an uncle-like figure and take them hunting uh, and so forth. And so these kind of relationships end up being so important throughout a child's life that, that those teachings are part of the toolbox that they are given. Then as each person explains about the name that they're gonna give and bestows the name upon them, oftentimes the names themselves don't tell the whole story. Like for example, if someone has a, a dream that there are natives sitting around a fire and they're making tobacco offerings into the fire and the smoke goes up and there's an opening in the clouds and the smoke goes through the hole in the, in the clouds, they wouldn't give a name like he who sits by a fire while smoke goes up through hole in clouds. They'll just say something like hole in the sky or hole in the day. And it, the name identifies a little piece of that story as a means of identifying a little piece of that spiritual teaching without divulging all of its secrets. So the names themselves are then used later as a way to identify the person spiritually, like the spirits will know this person by their native name. And they're also known that way, you know, with their fellow natives and so forth. Some people are a little more guarded about their spiritual information. It's considered a little bit private. So having a name that doesn't tell the whole story behind it um, is a way of maintaining a certain measure of privacy, but also, you know, being proud and owning the indigenous identity and so forth. Um, some families even wait to turn in their formal paperwork to the county government until they've had their naming ceremony for their child so that their indigenous name can be reflected in the paperwork. We didn't end up doing that with my crew, but all of them do certainly have their indigenous names. Through the process then, as each person who's a namesake divulges teachings and the story behind their names, then we, we do a prayer, um, speak to the creator and to our mother earth spirits in the, each of the four winds and all the spirits that are amongst and around us and take care of us and ask all of them to bless the baby, uh, to have a long, healthy, happy life and to carry his or her new names. Uh, then there's a blessing of the food and everybody eats. Usually the parents in my family, what we do is we provide gifts to all of our namesakes. Um, usually customary gifts would be something like a blanket for each namesake, or sometimes um, we'll give a little bit of wild rice or things like that. And those are kind of customary uh, gifts that would be given. It's not uncommon that when somebody has a, is giving someone a name, that they may also give gifts to the baby. So for example, Anna Gibbs did a lot of naming ceremonies and she was a namesake for a number of our children. And whenever she was a namesake, she would usually uh, give an eagle feather to the child and tell the parents, you know, place this in their bedroom somewhere as a means of protecting them uh, and watching over them. Uh, sometimes other namesakes have done things like given a dream catcher and said, hang this up by your child's crib or wherever they sleep. Um, and it'll filter their dreams. So only the positive dreams come through, uh, none of the scary ones. It'll let the good ones come through and catch the bad ones. Uh, so those are kind of common gifts that the name givers might give to the uh, child or person receiving names. Not everybody gets their culture handed to them on a silver platter. So if you happen to be someone who did not have a naming ceremony when you were young, there's no shame in that. It's not through any fault of your own, but it's never too late to reach out and get one. So I usually encourage people with a couple of, with a couple of teachings when they're 
uh, wanting to grow in their own spiritual journey. One is follow your own spiritual instincts about what feels right to you and who the right mentors might be for you. I've had times when someone is, you know, pointing out the greatest spiritual leader of all time to me, and I just never felt a connection or felt compelled to approach them. And that ended up being a good choice for me because it opened up a connection with someone else. Um, and I've also had times when there was someone that no one was pointing out who ended up being a really important mentor for me um, or even an important namesake for my children. So I've always relied upon my own instincts about those things, and you should too. Uh, the, the person who's the right teacher for one person might not always be the right teacher or namesake for another. And then as you think about who you want to you know, have as a namesake, something else that's, you know, a lot of people do is they might look first within their extended family and community um, and see if there's somebody who's close enough, you know, geographically close enough where they can actually be there to do some of the mentoring and maintain connection. And then, you know, expand your search outward as, as you need to. And sometimes as happens with humans, you know, one of my important mentors, Archie Mose, uh, lived in Balsam Lake, Wisconsin, which is over 200 miles away from my home. And, you know, I felt the connection and I had my reasons and ultimately it ended up being a really beautiful and important relationship. So you shouldn't be limiting yourself at the same time that you should be open and empower yourself to kind of filter and think about who you want to reach out to in your own spiritual journey. But ultimately, acquiring a native name is kind of one of these basic pieces in our spiritual foundation, as well as knowing who your clan is um, and the community that you're from that kind of ground us in identity. And it can be really positive and really powerful to have a naming ceremony and to know your native name. When you have native names, whether they were given to you as a child or acquired later in life, use them. Uh, it's, it's really important to use them. So when you do your own prayers, you want to put out some tobacco and just give thanks for the good things in your life or ask for help when you're having a hard time. A lot of times when I do that, I might say something like, Wagush, indigenous cause, you know, Migizi and Dodem. My name is Wagush, meaning fox. I'm from the Eagle Clan. You know, Gazoga Squadji Mekog and Dunjaba. I come from Leech Lake. Uh, and these are things that kind of ground me and identify me. And I will say that if I'm all alone speaking to the spirits to kind of vo give voice to my prayer at the beginning of the prayer. And then, you know, I'll speak to the spirits and I'll ask for whatever I'm, I'm asking for. Uh, so those names are part of your spiritual identification. Sometimes when somebody receives a native name, they may get special teachings. Like, uh, for example, if somebody gets a Thunderbird name, they might be told whenever the Thunderbirds come around and it's thundering and lightning to take a little bit of tobacco and step outside and put the tobacco out. Uh, and it's a way of acknowledging the spirits that are looking over you. Uh, some other people might be given colors with their name uh, that came in the dream or so or something like that. And so if that happens, then, you know, the person who receives the name might be told, just incorporate these colors when you make a powwow outfit or a ribbon skirt or a ribbon shirt or things like that. And it's a way to honor and acknowledge your name. And for me, I actually use my name often, uh, even when I'm in social circumstances and sharing with other people. And I think it's a way to, to honor my namesake, my name, and uh, it helps reinforce my strength in my knowledge of who I am as a native person. Miigwech. Thanks for watching today. I'm Anton Troyer. Let's keep in touch. I'm active on social media and my website has lots of information on my books, speaking engagements, free Ojibwe language resources, resources for teachers, and more. Miigwech.